All good. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, this is the breakfast of the History and Archive Committee. Uh, thanks, everyone, for participating yesterday in the, in the uh, poster session. Is that better? <laughs> um, we had a nice turnout. You'll hear a little bit later about the success of the poster session. It's been uh, really a, a nice uh, part of our entire history process here at the college. Uh, and, and we had another great year this year with a lot of people coming by to see posters, uh, a lot of uh, great, uh, great topics that we discussed in the posters. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, we've got some fun things to do this morning. Um, I'll, I'll first, uh, uh, this is the, gen the agenda. I'll introduce uh, Michael in a second. Uh, I'll give the update on the, on the archive committee, what, we've been, what happens outside of the meeting. Justin Barr will uh, give the award for the poster session, and then we'll have a talk from Julia Chavez um, uh, about her results of her uh, archives fellowship. Uh, and then Dr. Yeo will give the keynote address. So uh, first will be Michael Beasley, who's the archivist uh, for the college, and will give a summary of the, what's been going on uh, from the archive point of view. Hello. Thank you for all coming so early. Um, so yeah, I'm the assistant archivist and current interim archivist. For many of you might have known Megan Kennedy. Um, she left in August, um, and she was working at the college for about six or seven years, and she did a great job, and I hope to do the same moving forward. Um, so the mission of the archive is to advance the goals of the college and to acquire, preserve, and provide access uh, to records of enduring value. Um, and that's really important. We're, 100 year, we're over 100 years old, and we've got some great stuff in our archives, and it's great that it's being used as well. So the past year, um, we've been working on a few things. Um, we've been adding a History and Archive Committee activities to the archive web pages. Um, we have updated the 25 and 50 year <coughs> recognition and highlights page. So if you've been at the college for 25 or 50 years, you can go to become a member booth um, near registration and pick up um, a medallion. Um, and then we've also been adding surgical education modules to the web pages as well. In terms of collection and care, um, we continue to process uh, our ever-ending backlog of materials. Um, and then something I've been working on over the past few months, which I think is quite important, is the digitization um, of the Board of Regents minutes. Any important decision ever made at the college is in the Board of Regents minutes. Um, and up until now, if I had a research request, I'd have to go through page by page to try and find the information. By digitizing it, we're able to keyword search, and it will make the whole process a lot smoother. Um, and then we've also been maintaining and updating the search capabilities in the archive catalog. For the past couple of years, we've been using a system called Archivera, um, and that's available to search through the archives webpage on the ACS website. In terms of outreach, um, we've got a Fellow of Surgeons Biography Database, um, which is available again through the website, um, and that's run through the Archivera software. Um, and then we've also got a Digital Exhibitions Portal um, and Archives Highlights page. So the Archives Highlights page just highlights some small things within our, within our archive, whether it be a person, a building, or um, a document. Um, and then the digital, digital exhibitions portal is, is, is quite similar, but it just goes into a bit more focus. Um, and then also very importantly, which uh, we're excited about, is that we've got the Young Surgeon Essay Competition. Um, so I'll just briefly just quickly have a quick chat about that. Um, if you are interested, there's more information on the tables about the competition. But essentially, if you're under 45 and you're interested in writing an essay, it's perfect for you. We've got, um, the deadline is early January, um, and if you are over 45, you can be um, a co-author, um, but the main author has to be under 45. So um, again, if you are interested, please come see me or Dr. Barr um, after, um, and we can chat more about it. Um, otherwise, email us um, after the conference, or like I said, there should be some more information on the tables. Um, so that's just a quick update for me. So I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Papas to talk about the History and Archive Committee update.
Thanks, Michael. Um, just um, we'll just walk through briefly some of the uh, items. Uh, just as a reminder, if you haven't been here before, uh, this is the mission of the History and Archive Committee. It's an official function of the college to document its history. Of course, uh, it's also uh, a, an academic venture for us because we like talking about all kinds of history. Uh, and uh, we concentrate some on American history, but uh, you also hear about uh, history of medicine around the world, too. So it's uh, 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 lots of fun to topics that we discuss, uh, but this is the official mission of the History and Archive Committee. This uh, is the uh, finishing um, org chart, um, which ends at this meeting. Uh, I'm just finishing my term as uh, chair of the committee um, with uh, Peter Kernahan uh, as vice chair. Um, but this was the slate that just finished, and we had a, a meeting earlier this week where we um, reassigned some of the committees and chairs of committees. So this is the leadership group going forward with uh, Peter Kernahan, uh, now the executive, uh, a chair of the executive committee with uh, Susan Pores as the vice chair. Uh, so this will be the slate of uh, folks that will be heads of the committees and, and part of the executive committee uh, going forward. As you probably know, um, the History and Archive Committee sponsors articles in the bulletin of the college. Uh, they're always a fun read. Uh, I think they've been expanded now a thousand words. They used to be very brief reports at 500, but now they've been expanded to a thousand words and, and a couple of figures. So these are just some of the recent topics uh, that were discussed uh, and published in the, the archives, uh, I mean the um, college bulletin. So again, fun read, available online um, for anybody who's interested. There are several uh, topics and programs uh, uh, about history that will appear or have appeared this week. There are some remaining things that you might find interesting. Uh, the um, History and Archive Committee is sponsoring a panel session later this morning and right in the room next door here uh, a stroll uh, down surgical blind alleys, a history of surgical progress gone awry with progress in quotation marks. And I think you'll all enjoy that, um, talking about some of the things that didn't quite work out that seemed uh, incredibly important at the time, and some of them won Nobel Prizes and yet turned out not to, not to be such good ideas. So you'll, I think you'll find that very interesting. And again, uh, the, we have a, we had a poster session. Those posters are still available um, uh, downstairs. Uh, in addition to that, there's an e-poster uh, available online, and so there, there's a lot of e-posters to see. So if you get a chance to get online uh, at the college website, you can see the e-posters, which are also a lot of fun. Just uh, as you may remember, we don't have baseball cards, but we have college cards that have uh, our leaders uh, in the history of the college on these uh, baseball car type cards that you, um, you may enjoy. So you can pick up a set um, uh, if you visit the uh, uh, ACS Central in the lobby. I don't know if, if um, all of you belong to the uh, ACS history community, but it's a, kind of a fun thing. There's about 900 some or 930 uh, members uh, that uh, receive emails uh, of conversations that are, occur in a blog-like fashion. Uh, it's all about history, so uh, uh, just pure entertainment, fun stuff. People write about the papers they've written or uh, projects they're working on. You get updates about what the uh, History and Archive Committee is doing also on that same site. So easy to join like all the other communities for the college. Uh, so I encourage you to sign up um, and you'll get those communications and stay in touch with everything we're doing. And uh, I'm, I'm always amazed by the number of people who are reading these things. And then a lot of people respond back after they read something about their own insights into whatever was discussed on that particular blog. So it's a lot of interesting stuff um, to read. Easy to do, doesn't get in the way, comes onto your email, onto your phone. And if you don't want to read it, you can delete it. But it's uh, something uh, always fun for me every day to read. Um, we're we're going to talk a little bit about the 
the uh, Archives Fellowship. Uh, this is a, a program that we have where we award uh, an individual with a scholarship um, to use the uh, archive of the college to research a topic. And uh, we're, we'll hear from Julia Chavez in just a minute uh, to summarize, so she can tell us a summary of her project. Uh, but we, we are encouraging applications for the 24-25 application year. Uh, those uh, applications are, will be uh, finalized uh, in the March to May uh, time period this year. It's a $2,000 grant, uh, and again, it supports individuals who have the opportunity to use the resource that we have, which is this extensive archive, uh, to write a topic of their choice. So if you have anybody who's interested, uh, we're happy to accept uh, those applications. Again, um, every year um, we have an opening, uh, openings for people on the Executive Committee of the History and Archive Committee, and so uh, next year again we'll be opening it up, and, and again you'll get something uh, from the college which will announce that these uh, positions are open, so we encourage folks. Uh, we had about uh, 20 people who sent in their CVs this past year, uh, which allowed us to sort of bring a lot of new blood onto the various committees and the executive committee of the, of the organization. So it's a pleasure having new people involved and we encourage everybody to, to, uh, uh, to join up or send their CV in when, the, when you see this uh, come across your email um, over the next several months. Just highlighting uh, a couple of um, uh, books that have been published by our members. Uh, um, you heard, um, uh, if you were at the opening ceremony, you heard uh, all about Franklin Martin. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Telford. It was a lovely talk. Um, and he's, as you see, he's written a book about uh, one of the founding members of the college. And then, of course, Dr. Nakayama's book, uh, which we've talked about before, uh, is a book about uh, black surgeons in America. So I encourage you uh, to take a look at those if you get an opportunity. Outstanding historical contributions from our members. I'm going to now uh, ask Justin Barr to come up to tell us uh, how the poster session went and uh, who were our winners. Good morning. I don't know if you guys checked your emails today, but if you saw the Clinical Congress newsletter, you'll know that the poster session was actually highlighted as, as one of the items. Uh, so it was exciting to see that publicity. As Dr. Pappas mentioned, it was a really successful year this year. We had the most number of submissions ever. There were 280 uh, poster abstracts submitted, of which only 20 were selected for in-person presentation, which is a attrition rate higher than the, the scientific sessions, and that led to a really high level of poster quality, uh, both the, the, the 16 that you can still see downstairs, as well as the 37 that are available online. Uh, the poster session will, of course, open up again next year. We encourage you guys uh, to present. It is a great way to start on a history project that then further develops either into the, to the Young Fellows essay competition or, or a publication. Uh, either in the bulletin or, or one of the other uh, journals that we sponsor. So we had, um, again, 16 amazing poster presentations uh, yesterday. That was judged by six individuals. And the uh, consensus uh, runner-up was Dr. Uh, Tedesco talking about actually her grandfather's experience performing surgery under uh, deep sea pressure on an oil rig uh, in the, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And then the, the first place recipient was Dr. Dornbush who had a, uh, a terrific poster pulling primary sources together from both the, uh, the courts as well as the newspapers from 1800s Iowa, talking about the dissection of a, a, uh, a local cadaver that was then uh, led to basically an anatomy riot in the town and contributed to the development of an anatomy act or legislation that permitted the dissection of bodies in Iowa that became something of a model for the, for the National Body Act. So uh, if you all would like to come up and receive your certificates, and if we could give a round of applause uh, today.
Again, a great poster session. I, I did want to highlight, uh, I talked to several of the folks who were presenting and uh, encouraged all of them to convert these projects into manuscripts. Um, you know, I think if you do that much work to create a poster, you basically do a little bit more work to uh, make a manuscript. There are lots of outlets for history papers these days, and if you, ha if you need some advice about that, um, I'm happy to talk to anybody about uh, the places we send our manuscripts, history manuscripts. Dr. Kernahan has some great ideas. Justin, of course, does. Don Nakayama, of course, has some great ideas. Um, the American Surgeon. So lots of places as an outlet for these manuscripts. So uh, if it's good enough to be presented uh, at this meeting, I think it's certainly good enough for a manuscript. So I encourage everybody to proceed to, to the next step, really, if they've, if they've done this much research. I'd like to next uh, introduce Julia Chavez, uh, again, the winner of our uh, Archives Fellowship. Um, she's going to come up now and give us a brief presentation, sort of summarizing her work to date. Hi. Um, I'm really excited to present what I found over the last year. Um, this project came to be because I was really interested in a question that Dr. Angelos had posed. He said that. Um, you know, surgical ethics to some may seem like an oxymoron or maybe something that's developed, uh, garnered attention really only in the last 20 or so years. But if we were to look back, we would see a long history of attention to ethical issues in, in surgery. Um, and so I actually first tried to answer this question as a first year medical student. Um, I ran into some roadblocks and had to put the project away. Um, but last year I saw the announcement for the fellowship and it was the perfect opportunity to reopen the question and to use the wealth of resources at the archives to answer um, that question. Uh, I really loved spending this last year at the archives um, and learning a lot. So I'm excited to share a little bit of what I learned. Um, to set the stage, uh, we, um, uh, in the uh, mid-1800s, there was the introduction of asepsis and um, anesthesia and the adoption of that technique. And so then around um, the, so this changed the landscape of surgery. It wasn't uh, procedures like um, amputations and only. It, there were more complex procedures that were able to be done um, and there was just a really rapid expansion of surgery. Um, and so what this led to was a regulatory and ethical void uh, where it became necessary to identify who is a competent surgeon, like who can we trust uh, to do these more complex operations. Um, and so in that, uh, so that is why the American College of Surgeons was founded to kind of fill that void. Um, and so then uh, from uh, the founding of the ACS, uh, there, um, we, we're more familiar with like some of the more contemporary issues, but in between that time, there's some well-documented issues like fee splitting, uh, but the question was, you know, what others are there? Um, and like I said, I learned a lot, um, and I'd love to talk about all of that today, but I'm narrowing it down to four, um, and the rapid expansion of surgery kind of manifested in four main issues that the Board of Regents uh, named the four evils in surgical practice. So I'll go through each of these one by one and use it to highlight uh, some of the what the ethics committee did and how they worked. Um, so there are unjustified surgery, ghost surgery, fee splitting, and the issue of exorbitant fees. I'll start with unjustified surgery. So this one was defined as uh, an operation in which the indications were inadequate or the procedure was contrary to what is generally accepted in surgical practice. And I was expecting to find something like the debates today about whether um, antibiotics only for appendectomy or for appendicitis or appendectomy. Um, and I did find uh, some of that. There were some debates about whether an incidental appendectomy was appropriate and some debates about other procedures that were uh, common at the time. Um, but what I found also was something a little bit uh, uh, more uh, dark, <laughs> more serious. Uh, it, um, uh, I'll read this letter. It really illustrates a picture of what uh, sur the surgery was like and sort of the um, reason why the ACS was founded um, and like what it was founded in response to. Um, so the letter is from Rose Clemenko. She was the widow. Uh, she was married to a prominent neurologist in New York um, and she had the experience where three different family members were widowed uh, by surgery, and so she dis she writes a letter to the regents called "May I Ask Surgery a Question," where she details uh, these cases. I'll describe. I'll summarize two of them. 
Uh, the first is in 1917, uh, she says, a 32-year-old man who was neurotic, maladjusted, and unhappy and introspective uh, was suffering from nerve strain and headaches, and a neurologist believed he had found symptoms of a brain tumor and advised an operation. The patient and family were not informed of the high mortality, instead being led to believe that the operation would settle his difficulties, and uh, he died on the table. Um, the autopsy later showed that no tumor had existed. So she asks, is it a typical case? How is it to be answered? Can surgery offer any justification that will remove the injustice done to this family? She also uh, describes a second case uh, of a, uh, another um, family member. She says a 31-year-old father of two who took his business and himself too seriously. Um, while he was generally healthy, he had stomach issues, and for him, a doctor advised an exploratory operation. Thinking it was safe uh, and that he'd be back to work in just a week, um, he didn't uh, tell his family, but unfortunately he died uh, of a hemorrhage. And so, um, again, she asked, uh, may I ask surgery a question? Is this something that's necessary? Um, so it really paints a picture of sort of a different landscape of surgery than what we are familiar with today. And uh, practices like this are what led to important projects like the standardization of um, uh, surgical practices, uh, more public documenting, um, uh, um, quality projects that are very uh, uh, prevalent today, but they were really new um, before. The next one that I'll talk about is ghost surgery. This one's defined as a surgery in which the patient is not informed of or is misled to the identity of the operating surgeon. Um, there were some lawsuits where patients had uh, gone to see a specific surgeon and they had wanted them to do the operation and uh, they, the surgeon had uh, delegated it to a colleague without the patient knowing, but that really ended up not being the, the focus with uh, the for why ghost issue was a really common issue. It had more to do with uh, the question of, of resident training. Um, and so the, there was consensus that there's no argument uh, about uh, that the patient should know who is performing the surgery. But what do we do in the case of resident training? How much should we uh, disclose their involvement? Um, for this issue, I would like to go through the timeline of uh, the debate and sort of highlight the uh, what was going on behind the scenes, the internal correspondence between the Board of Regents about this issue and the meetings um, uh, compared to what was, you know, publicly announced. Um, so in December of 1953, they adopted the definition of ghost surgery that we read earlier. Um, but people wrote in, fellows wrote in, uh, they had concerns about the role of house staff, um, and so they were asking, could you kind of address that, that point? Um, so the board met again, um, the issue was revisited, they went through a few drafts and ultimately adopted a revised definition that added, that accounted for that. So they added that it's proper for the responsible surgeon to delegate any part of the operation to a patient. Um, and uh, so they adopted this one to kind of address the, the remaining questions. Um, but there was mixed reception, so some fellows wrote in saying that they did not approve of this. Um, I don't believe patients would approve of the delegation of any part of the operation, much less the most important part. Um, and then this letter got to the regents, and they also responded to it with kind of mixed things. They were saying, he doesn't really have a leg to stand on. I wouldn't take this too seriously, but maybe we should add a clause uh, that would make it clear that the patient should understand that the surgery is a team operation and that uh, the the uh, supervising surgeon may not be doing all of it by themselves. Um, but despite this, they sent a survey to 30 uh, surgery training directors uh, with these questions just to make sure there was consensus before they uh, issued another announcement. Um, and then ultimately, they uh, re decided to reaffirm the revision and um, start there. Um, in the next year, uh, there was some transition in leadership and, um, you know, more back and forth. Um, and they actually rescinded the revision, returned to the original statement, uh, which was less controversial. Um, one thing I wanted to add is that uh, uh, Dr. Evarts Graham, who had been on the board uh, during the first uh, phase where they had decided to adopt the revision, um, he was lamenting that the new board didn't want to do that and had preferred to go back to the original statement. And so I found this letter that said, um, uh, kind of, uh, he says, since I'm no longer a member of the Board of Regents, but only a member of the Council of Kivitzers, I cannot take any active part in changing the sentiment of the Regents. Um, and Kivitzers is a Yiddish term for people 
people who give uh, unsolicited opinions. Um, outside of surgery, there were some good faith art, uh, attempts to capture the issue. This is an article by a moral theologist named John Lynch, um, and he discussed the issue of, of ghost surgery, in which case it is deceptive, in which case it's part of the nature of training and uh, part of our responsibility to train competent surgeons. Um, on the other hand, uh, there were also some articles in the New York Times with sort of inflammatory, maybe bad faith attempts to uh, uh, explain the issue. Um, so this one's titled, Patients Unaware Surgery May Be, uh, Surgeon May Be a Beginner. And there were a lot more articles like this. Um, and this illustrates the, what the Board of Regents were responding to whenever they made these decisions. They were responding to a lot of uh, difference of opinion within the the leadership uh, within the fellow community and also in the public. Uh, the next issue I'll talk about is fee splitting. Um, this one is the one that's better documented, so I'll just uh, add a couple things. Um, so in general, fee splitting is the idea that when a uh, medical doctor referred a patient to a surgeon, they might receive a kickback. And the concern with that was that um, you know, they might be referring patients for the financial incentive instead of because the surgery is really indicated. Um, the definition, a little bit more broadly, to kind of capture the different ways this could show up, includes that uh, when um, that a joint bill, itemized or not, could be interpreted as fee splitting, uh, according to the principles decided by this council. Um, so another thing that the ethics committee did was sort of field questions from fellows. So here we have a letter from a concerned fellow saying, uh, I'm writing with a question of medical ethics. I'm planning to go into a joint practice with another obstetrician gynecologist and an internist. I am also an obstetrician gynecologist. Um, uh, what I wish to know, does this constitute fee splitting? I'm anxious to not engage in any unethical procedure, and I would appreciate your opinion in this matter. Um, and they received a response about, you know, how to manage that. Um, and he was right to be concerned because at the same time, there were other people that were writing in anonymous letters, kind of reporting different um, practices in the area. Uh, so this letter is from a uh, medical doctor, not a fellow of the College of Surgeons. And uh, he says that he's a young medical physician and he's been offered money uh, after referring some patients, which he clarifies, I refused, um, and then goes on to name the specific surgeons that he believes are engaging in this practice as I, you know, I leave it to you to do the investigation. Um, so that was in Brooklyn. Um, there was uh, some, so one way that this could look is that there was a more scrutiny for individual surgeons, uh, but another thing that happened is that if an entire community was engaging in fee splitting, then the whole area would kind of be um, restricted. Um, so, so one of the ways that the ethics committee could enforce the principles that they would announce are, were by uh, deciding that you needed to adhere to those or you wouldn't be able to be considered a fellow of the college. Um, and so there was a pretty big folder. So this is a um, report from uh, 1953 about the investigation of the Scranton area practices. They had promised to change, they didn't change. And a year later, um, it was still considered a restricted area. Um, this, the, the folder for the investigation goes from 1951 to 1959. Um, the first folder is for Scranton, the second one is for Brooklyn, and uh, one of the articles that the regents would uh, bounce back and forth um, in their correspondence was this one about the whole town splitting fees. And uh, they talk about Cranston City, a fictitious mid-Atlantic uh, city, which I think we can deduce is, is Scranton. All right, and the last issue is the one of exorbitant fees. This one they defined as a uh, fee is excessive when it's greater than the patient is reasonably able to pay or higher than justified by the services rendered. Um, and this isn't something that now we would consider to be the responsibility of an individual surgeon. Uh, I think that it reflects maybe a little bit more when, when surgery was less complicated, maybe it was more of a uh, relationship more directly between the patient and the surgeon rather than like the full medical team and the pre and post operative care. Um, but uh, this was uh, actually um, in a part of the pledge that fellows would take. The original fellows pledge in 1916 included a commitment to make to make fees commensurate with the services rendered and with the patient rights. Um, and through the various iterations of the pledge, this one actually remained in the pledge until uh, one of the more recent revisions in 2004. Um, so the way that the ethics committee uh, handled this issue, it was a bigger one. So they uh, formed a subcommittee to uh, study exorbitant fees. Um, although they uh, uh, acknowledged that this um, 
you know, most of the fees are reasonable, but we can't deny that there are these cases of outrageous fees uh, being charged to patients. They give the example of a patient who makes $40 a week was charged $1,500 for a cast. Um, similar to before, uh, they started by sur make, doing a survey and kind of addressing, uh, getting a sense of the scope of the issue. They sent out a short survey to representatives from general surgery and subspecialties asking what the most common were. Uh, they went through and um, documented the prices across the um, nation. And um, in response to the survey, a few questions, uh, a few things came up. Um, one is that they debated, should we set a fee schedule? Um, is that something that is that the College of Surgeons should do? Um, they talked about if we did, what would go into deciding what the cost of a surgery is? And a lot of the discussions, um, they brought up uh, aspects of surgery that reflect sort of how our VUs are calculated today. Um, and then it also was clear that the surgeons felt a real responsibility uh, to the uh, a moral responsibility to equity and care. So the question, the debates were something like, um, should we charge less so that more patients are able to access it, or should we um, set the price a little higher so that uh, at their discretion, surgeons are able to do charity cases without compromising the um, the sustainability of their practice. Um, again, like the other issues, this was a public relations concern. So for patients, they were reading articles like, does your doctor charge too much? Um, okay, but how much will it cost? Um, other ones saying, uh, you know, with, with a list of uh, prices and letting them know kind of what they should expect. Um, on the other hand, for surgeons, um, in the medical economics journal, they had uh, some advice about how to set their surgical fees. Um, so overall, uh, the, um, I really enjoyed uh, working on this this year. Um, one of the findings is that the Ethics Committee was extremely active um, since the founding of the college. A lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, they were really grappling with a lot of ethical issues and it's definitely not a contemporary concept that has come up just in the last 20 years. Um, in fact, a lot of what's inherent to the practice of surgery, uh, like putting patients above financial incentives and uh, ensuring the competency of, of surgeons and adequate training um, is just part of what we uh, take for granted as a part of what surgery is. And so these were some of the issues on which the um, practice of surgery was founded. Um, something else I found interesting was that uh, originally the college was kind of established to identify um, uh, who were responsible surgeons that patients could trust. Um, but even after the American Board of Surgery had developed their licensing exam and everything, the uh, American College of Surgeons Fellowship uh, still stood as, um, they debated whether it was still relevant and ultimately they decided that that is for competent training but we are still considering the full like ethic of the, the surgeon and sort of uh, saying that they, that they meet that too. Um, the last thing is in the um, social transformation of American medicine. They talk about how uh, for any group, the accumulation of authority requires the resolution of the uh, internal problem of consensus and the external problem of, um, of, <laughs> uh, thor uh, of legitimacy. And throughout the different um, activities of the Ethics Committee, we can see that they were really grappling with this internal issue of uh, consensus within the uh, college and then also externally um, making sure that the, uh, the college as a whole had legitimacy and they were something that the pa patients could trust. Um, so these are the, the archives. Um, I went just through a fraction of what I learned, but there's so much more uh, to learn. I really want to thank the uh, ACS History and Archives Committee. This was one of the most meaningful projects of uh, my time in medical school, and I'm just really grateful to get to dive into this question for a year. Um, and I also want to thank Dr. Angelos uh, for uh, your mentorship throughout this and helping make sense of uh, everything that I was finding. Thank you. I think, we, I think we have time for some questions. Please, uh, if you come to the microphone, this is being uh, broadcasted, so uh, we want to make sure people hear your question. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. That's all. Tell them a lot of reading. Uh, so my question focuses on your reading and your review and um, uh, what you would recommend for future people. But with new technology of scanning, and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence can review all of these words without judgment, of course, 
in about a second that would take you a year to read. So um, what are we, how, how are we going to review all of these letters, especially in my own case? I probably write 10,000 social media pieces that go off into the clouds to one formal letter. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to review communication between all of us via social media in the future that never reaches the uh, yellowed pages of uh, the lettered archives? Yeah, I was, thank you for your question. Um, big question, uh, I would start by saying that um, if AI could, so I, I skipped over, um, I stuck to reading the typewritten letters. Some of the handwritten ones were pretty difficult to read. So if AI could help with that, then I think that would augment our ability to examine the archives. Um, but other than that, I would say um, that the, one thing I wanted to add about this is that I think um, the archives were, so, so these documents were all kind of accumulated uh, in retrospect. Um, somebody wrote an um, email um, not long ago saying that they should separate the ethics committee files from uh, everything else. And so uh, these were kind of gathered from other ones. So it's a little less um, organized and I think easy, like uh, a little, it's a little more challenging to kind of like go through and analyze just because it has been pulled together from different sources. So I um, think that it required just a lot of uh, uh, flexibility and kind of um, uh, being adaptive to, you know, what we found. So it's, yeah. Is there anything else? Other thoughts or questions? Thank you again. Thank you so much. I, thank you. Thank you very much. I think you can see why the, uh, this uh, fellowship is so important, the kind of information that we get. And, and um, it also highlights why we need to digitize the archives. And there's been a lot of discussion about what it's going to take to digitize, to, to get all this information so AI could evaluate it, of course. Uh, so that's a project yet to come. Finally, uh, I'm happy to uh, introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Charlie Yeo. Uh, many of you know uh, Dr. Yeo, but I'll briefly uh, tell you about him. Um, he's a, originally a, a graduate from Princeton uh, undergrad and went to Hopkins Medical School, uh, was asked to stay on at Hopkins to do his residency, um, uh, did his residency, joined the faculty, and I think spent 20 years learning how to become an academic surgeon from some real masters, and he became a master himself. Um, in, in 2002, was it, I think, um, uh, joined, uh, became the, um, t yeah, 2002, became the chair of surgery, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 2002, became the chair of surgery at Jefferson. And he, he's going to now um, uh, introduce, uh, introduce us to that history of a very famous department and there's some of the leadership and other interesting aspects of that department. So thank you, Charlie. <clears throat> this talk is meant to be a, a, a fun talk. And um, I want to say that I'm very biased. I hope I'm in a room of friends here. Um, by that, I mean surgeon friends. And uh, this talk is going to be very pro-surgery. Uh, the themes are going to be themes of innovation, entrepreneurialism, um, politics. There's going to be some politics in this. The slides are my own. Um, I take full responsibility for the content. The errors are my own, and not the, no errors can be attributed to the college. And I love Julia's talk, by the way. So Julia, well, well done. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk to you today about the Aikens <clears throat> masterpiece, The Gross Clinic. But before I do that, I wanted to just give a little setting of where we are now in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, rooting for the Phillies in game seven tonight, <laughs> but uh, Jeff <clears throat> Jefferson Health. Uh, when I first came to Jefferson in 205, uh, it was one hospital, and now we have 18 hospitals. We have over five million what I call educational encounters or uh, patient, patient interactions. Uh, we have uh, nearly 5,000 physicians, over 9,000 surgeons, so it's a very, very large healthcare system uh, in our region. We also have uh, 10 colleges, four schools, 
uh, but the oldest school and the school we're going to concentrate on today <clears throat> is now called the Sidney Kimmel Medical College, but it was founded as the Jefferson Medical College, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the founding of, of Jefferson. We have now over 200 graduate programs, uh, nearly 70,000 alumni, 17 NCAA Division II teams. But the main focus of the talk today is, is this magnificent uh, masterpiece painted by Thomas Aikens. It was on the cover of many textbooks for many, many years. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how this masterpiece touched my life. This is its current state at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. <clears throat> so, so let's go back. Um, the objectives of this talk are to, to go back to 1876. Uh, the, the United States is just over 100 years old. We're going to talk a little bit about Philadelphia, a fellow named McClellan, who was the founder of our medical school. We're going to talk about Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania, Jefferson College, Jefferson Medical College, Samuel Gross, and Thomas Aikens. I'm going to tell the story of a very contentious and very expensive art sale uh, in 2006, just one year after I arrived at, at Jefferson. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the masterpiece itself, talk about the positive resolution of the sale, at, and then add several postscripts. <clears throat> I consider myself a senior surgeon, and I have no disclosures, but let me disclose that I did not personally know Thomas Aikens, George McClellan, nor Samuel David Gross. They all passed long before I was born. So here's the setting. The U.S. in 1876, the Civil War had ended 11 years previously. Lincoln had been assassinated in 1865. President Andrew Johnson was impeached by the House and missed Senate conviction by just one vote. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant was ending his two terms as president. The first college football game occurred in 1869. That was where Rutgers beat Princeton, my alma mater. The Philadelphia Phillies, who are the oldest team in Major League Baseball in the same city with the same name, they haven't even been founded yet in 1883. But uh, our medical college was founded in 1824. And so next year we're going to be celebrating our 200th uh, birthday, our bicentennial. So uh, this is Jefferson, as many of our uh, alumni knew it at the time with the college building. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the chairman. So there, there, there are four, what I call, to use a, a basketball analogy, this is the first four. The first four were McClellan, Pancoast, Mutter, and Gross. And um, we're going to focus really on McClellan and Gross. Then there was what I call the, the era of the duality, where politics came into play. And there were actually two chairs of surgery for a 74-year period. There were the professors of the principles of surgery and clinical surgery, and the professors of the practice of surgery and clinical surgery. And it was the fellow here at the bottom right, John H. Gibbon Jr., who was able to unify into the modern era the surgical chairman because of the invention of the heart-lung machine and the esteem which with he was held in the surgical community. And then there's the modern era uh, up to today. So we're going to go back and we're really going to focus on, of the first four, we're going to focus on number one, George McClellan, and number four, Samuel David Gross. And Aikens is also a protagonist of the story. So George McClellan, he was born in Woodstock, but those of you that are at my era, he was not on stage with Santana or Joan Baez or Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. This is Woodstock, Connecticut. He was born in Woodstock, Connecticut in 1796. He was of Highland Scotch ancestry. He went to the Woodstock Academy for his early learnings and then graduated from Yale in 1815. He was a chemistry major and graduated uh, at the old age of 18 years. He then did a short preceptorship in medicine <clears throat> in Connecticut, but traveled to Philadelphia to become a pupil of John Singh Dorsey. And then he went actually to the University of uh, Pennsylvania Medical School, graduating in the class of 1816. Now, 
Philadelphia was a, a place where there were many physicians. He hung out his shingle at 6th and Walnut, which is just a few blocks from my office. <clears throat> and five years, five years after graduating medical school, he sought to open his own medical school. I challenge any PGY-5 resident today to think that you're gonna start your own medical school just five years after graduating from medical school, but he was bold enough to do this and he petitioned to start a medical department and he did it as part of Jefferson College in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. And the, the, the issue becomes, <clears throat> why Cannonsburg? Um, and not that there's, uh, we, I've been there, it's a wonderful place, but it's 312 miles away from Philadelphia. It's a 10-day stagecoach ride to get from Philadelphia to Cannonsburg. So <clears throat> it, it couldn't have been for convenience sake. There must be a reason why he decided to found this medical college at Jefferson, uh, for, with Jefferson College. <clears throat> Here's an old dogger type of uh, George McClellan from 1845. So the question is, <clears throat> why Jefferson College? Well, <clears throat> it, it comes down to religion. It comes down to who he knew and his deep ties to the Presbyterian faith. He was raised as a Presbyterian, a New Age Presbyterian, and <clears throat> Jefferson College was far away from the sphere of influence of the University of Pennsylvania. It was basically in the hinterlands. In 1824, it was at the frontier of America in some senses. It was over the Allegheny Mountains, across the, great, the mighty Susquehanna River. It was at the frontier of the US. And by linking with Jefferson College and individuals that he knew in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania, he was able to place people on the board of trustees that he knew and trusted, doctors of divinity, such as Ashbel Green and Ezra Stiles Ely, who were both graduates of the College of New Jersey and also uh, Princeton University. So the history of Jefferson College goes back to this individual, Reverend uh, McMillan, who was a graduate of the College of New Jersey, now known as, as Princeton. He founded the college as a log cabin school in, 18, uh, in 1780. It was subsequently chartered as Cannonsburg Academy in 1794 and later the moniker, the nomenclature, was changed to Jefferson College in 1802. So Macmillan, who, who was a, a student of divinity, a reverend, uh, founded Jefferson College. This is the log cabin that still exists in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. It's on the National Historic Register. <clears throat> this is the rural landscape of Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania at the time. So, <clears throat> and here's another I think amazing piece to the founding of a medical college back in that era. So on June the 2nd, 1824, McClellan along with Drs. Eberly Clapp and uh, Mr. Jacob Green Esquire, a lawyer, they sent a formal application to the trustees of the Jefferson College, essentially similar to the Board of Regents, if you will. They sent a formal application for permission to establish a medical school in Philadelphia 312 miles away from Jefferson College. This would allow these men <coughs> to start a medical faculty, to give lectures under the charter of a mother school that was far, far away. This was a strategy to circumvent their absolute frustration stemming from their inability to obtain a charter from the Pennsylvania State Legislature in Harrisburg because they had petitioned to Harrisburg and had gotten no response. So this is June the 2nd, 1824. And here are the four uh, individuals with McClellan up here on the uh, upper left. And here's again a picture of the rural setting of, of, uh, of Jefferson College. Well, in that very same month, <clears throat> and, and let me say, this is before computers. This is before emails. This is before text messages. In that very same month, the trustees at Cannonsburg agreed to this deal. They said, let's do it. We, we want to do it. We want to get in the medical business. So articles of union were submitted to the four aforementioned applicants. 
and they were consummated on October the 30th, 1824, so almost, almost exactly to the day, 199 years ago. So this is considered the founding of what's the seventh or eighth uh, oldest medical college in the country. And of course, this meant that Philadelphia was the only city in the US that had two medical schools at the time. The skeleton faculty of this new medical college gave lectures in private facilities near Independence Square. The first lecture was actually given by George McClellan, a surgeon. And I always remind my uh, health system leadership that none of us would have a job in Philadelphia at Jefferson if it weren't for George McClellan, who was a surgeon. And I'd like to sort of underscore that uh, to, to our leadership. The first faculty meeting was held a few days before Christmas in 1824. Here's the founding document, which we, we still have. And on January the 1st, 1825, a lease was signed to rent the old Tivoli Theater. And uh, that was rented at the, at the high rate of $550 a year. Some renovations took place, cost $100 to renovate from the Tivoli Theater to the hall of the Jefferson Medical College. And they also opened an infirmary, not a hospital, but an outpatient clinic on May the 16th, 1825, for free medical and surgical care for outpatients. And many consider this to be the first clinic established in any college uh, in the United States. Here's a picture of the Tivoli Theater, which became the medical hall of Jefferson Medical College. Six professors lectured in the hall of Jefferson Medical College. The tuition <coughs> was, hold your hats, $78 a year. The fees were paid directly to the professors who issued tickets for the lectures. Now, <clears throat> there was a time when um, there was a conflict between the uh, long-standing, very, very excellent medical college, uh, medical school at the University of Pennsylvania, and this uh, fledgling new medical college. And in fact, the chairman of the board of trustees at Penn on January the 30th, read a protest before the Pennsylvania State uh, Senate in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, challenging the right and the power of the Jefferson Medical College to grant the MD degree. So they were challenging essentially the existence of this new uh, upstart medical college. And well, as things happened in politics, several months passed and they decided to take this up one week before the scheduled graduation of the first class. And this caused some consternation uh, in doc with Dr. McClellan. So there's a famous story of George McClellan, the surgeon getting on a horse and riding to Harrisburg, stopping overnight in York, PA, uh, learning that there was gonna be a vote on April the 7th. He made what's called the legendary dash to the state capitol to uh, deliver an impassioned speech supporting the granting of the doctoral diploma. His efforts were rewarded by a favorable action, by a favorable vote in the legislature, and uh, the medical college was officially uh, recognized. So this was, this was a big deal because there were 20 graduates scheduled to graduate one week later. McClellan wanted that to happen. So exactly one week later, on April 14, 1826, there was the first commencement. 20 matriculants received the MD degree. There were actually, this is the list of the 20. There's uh, two countries, 19 people from the US and, uh, and, and one Irishman named John Graham. So eight, from eight states, two countries, and the fun fact is that uh, the relationship remained intact uh, was subsequently dissolved 14 years later. That is, Jefferson Medical College became independent of Jefferson College in 1839. <clears throat> Here, uh, a fun thing from our archives is from 1827, the, um, the handwritten um, tuition. And one thing that I, like here's the professor of anatomy, $14, the professor of surgery, $14, Materia Medica, $14, and then midwifery was only cost $10. Uh, I don't exactly know why that, why that was, um, but there was certainly a difference in the, in the fees. Now, this was McClellan. McClellan was um, well known to Samuel David Gross. 
Gross actually says in his, in his autobiography about McClellan that his impulsive disposition often brought him into trouble, a man of genius, quick to perceive and prompt to execute. Probably no man ever handled a scalpel with more dexterity. McClellan operated prior to anesthesia, so you had to be fast and quick uh, to be a successful surgeon. He was a great innovator in medical education as he brought medical education from the amphitheater uh, to the bedside. And he was ousted in 1839 after a dispute with the Board of Trustees. And I want everyone to remember this, the dispute with the Board of Trustees, because this becomes important as we talk about the Gross Clinic. Uh, McClellan went on to start another medical school, so he actually founded two medical schools in his life. This was the medical department of Pennsylvania College at Gettysburg. <laughs> he died of a perforated sigmoid colon. You've all heard the name McClellan. You've probably not heard it because of our medical school. You've heard it because of American history. And his son, uh, General George Brinton McClellan, very famous, uh, pictured here, uh, the son of our founder. Um, he was in multiple Civil War battles. You might say he avoided multiple Civil War battles. That's a whole other discussion. He was the Democratic nominee for president against Lincoln in 1864. Um, obviously, he lost that election, uh, but he was a very famous uh, person in his own right. He's buried in Trenton at Riverview Cemetery. My wife, Terry, and I visited there last year. Here we are in front of his grave, and he has the, uh, the tallest grave, the tallest obelisk uh, in, the, in the cemetery. It, it's quite a dramatic, uh, dramatic uh, monument. We, uh, we honored uh, Dr. McClellan um, with the McClellan Honor Society, which is for the students that excel in the third year surgical clerkship. So I wanted to give that setting so we understand a little bit more about the background for Samuel David Gross and, and uh, Thomas Aikens. So Gross was born in 1805 in Easton, Pennsylvania. He was Pennsylvania Dutch, spoke German, and uh, learned English at the age of 12. He prepped at Lawrenceville Academy, uh, which is right on the right on the Delaware River. I was sent a couple years ago from someone who understands my interest in this, the uh, catalog of graduates from Lawrenceville. And in the classes of 1822 to 1825, here's the list of matriculants to Lawrenceville. And the only one that has any annotation uh, by his name is Samuel David Gross. So even in the history of Lawrenceville, he's seen as a very, very um, you know, important figure uh, for Lawrenceville Academy. Um, Gross enrolled as a private student of McClellan's and then uh, entered the class of 1828. He wrote a thesis on the nature and treatment of cataract. Uh, in medical school, he was um, described as being industrious and ambitious. And in his autobiography, there's the quote that medicine was the goddess of my idolatry. Um, he opened an office on 5th Street opposite Independence Square. He was clinically unsuccessful. He made his income translating German textbooks into English. That was his native language. And his, uh, his two-volume autobiography tells you how much he got for every translation. He married a 21-year-old widow, a gal named Louisa Ann Weissel. They had four adult children, uh, four children who survived to adulthood and uh, four that did not. Um, and his, actually his oldest son, Samuel W., uh, uh, succeeded him. There's a picture of Gross. He moved back to Easton. He wrote his first, first textbook, which is called Anatomy, Physiology, and Diseases of Bones and Joints. So at this point, he's somewhat of an anatomist, a physiologist. He then went to Cincinnati for a seven-year period as a demonstrator and then the chair of pathological anatomy wrote his second textbook, Elements of Pathological Anatomy. So now he's a pathologist. He then goes to Louisville, to the Louisville Medical Institute. Uh, he did animal exper experiments on intestinal wounds. He was an eminent urologist removing bladder stones. He studied airway foreign bodies. He and his wife, Louisa, were a notable host. Um, European surgeons uh, traveling across the Atlantic would visit Dr. Gross. And then in 1856, he was called back to Jefferson, back to his alma mater, to succeed Thomas Mütter um, as the fourth chair of surgery. He was a prolific writer. He wrote the classic textbook of the day. It went through six editions. It was called System of Surgery. 
Um, Gross also wrote this small pocket manual, uh, the Manual of Military Surgery, around the time of the start of the Civil War. It was published in Philadelphia, uh, right on Washington Square, and it was attributed to Gross, and it was distributed to all of the Union corpsmen. It was also um, smuggled across the Mason-Dixon line down into the Confederacy, and it was republished in Richmond uh, without any attribution of his name. His name was left off of it, but it was published as the Manual of Military Surgery and distributed to the Confederate corpsmen. So both sides of the Civil War used Gross's textbook, Manual of uh, Medical, uh, Military Surgery. He wrote a total of uh, 12 books and his famous two-volume autobiography. He was a big organizer, um, and uh, the important thing for this group is that he is the, uh, he's the founder of the American Surgical Association. His, his profile is on the American Surgical Association logo. So he was uh, called the Emperor of American Surgery or the Nestor of American Surgery. We have several antiques in our department. Uh, we have his operating table, his bust, a small portrait, various books and personal items. He made many contributions to surgery, including stay sutures for wound dehiscence, uh, forceps for bronchial foreign bodies, wiring of clavicular and uh, shoulder problems, etc. He died in 1884, cremated, and his ashes are in woodlands. The, the, the thing that he's probably most famous for was that he ignored Joseph Lister. He was not a Listerian, and that becomes important. Uh, we have the Gross Monument, which at one point was on the Mall in Washington, D.C. Um, this was cast by Calder. It's a magnificent bronze, and it, it's, the, um, it, it's the exact pose that uh, Gross has in, in the uh, Aikens masterpiece. So let's talk a bit about the masterpiece now. This is the famous Gross Clinic. Who was Thomas Aikens? Uh, born in Philadelphia, went, uh, went to the uh, Central High School, which was a very, very progressive high school at the day. He was educated in an elite modern setting, graduated in 1861, right at the start of the Civil War. He enrolled in classes and drawing at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. He took anatomy courses at Jefferson, and that's the link between Aikens and Gross. And he went to Paris right after the end of the Civil War. He became uh, to become an artist, he uh, enrolled at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and he uh, interacts with Jerome and Dumont and Bonnat and many of the famous, famous um, uh, artists of the day. Um, just to show you his talent, uh, this was one of his drawings from his high school days of, of, uh, of a lathe. Uh, and then another amazing watercolor uh, sculler on the Schuylkill River. So, um, Aikens comes back to Philadelphia in 1870. He's uh, have a list here of many of his notable works, Max Schmidt in a Single Skull, The Agnew Clinic, uh, The Concert Singer. He introduced the camera to an American uh, uh, art studio, and he died in 1916. But the story of the Gross Clinic starts at the time that Gross was involved with the organizing uh, the medical part of the Centennial uh, Art Exhibition uh, at, the, at the 100th anniversary of America uh, held in Fairmont Park in Philadelphia. And um, Aikens paints gross at work, we'll see that. The, the canvas was thought to be absolutely outrageous and too, um, too graphic for the Victorian sensibilities, so it was actually displayed in a side gallery. Uh, at the end of the exhibition, it was purchased by the Jefferson alumni for the price of $200. Remember that number, $200. And for decades, it was displayed on the second floor of the college building. So this is uh, one of our lecture halls to the right, and here's a stairway, and this is the Gross Clinic displayed. I've had many Jefferson alumni come up to me and tell me that they used to come out in the 40s and 50s. They'd come out after the lecture. Um, they would smoke their cigarettes, and they would put their cigarettes out on the, on, the, on the frame of the masterpiece. At the time, they didn't consider it a masterpiece. It was just uh, the gross clinic there. So the canvas gained national and international acclaim. Its valuation increased over time. Jefferson is very well known for our, uh, quite a number of portraits, but none is famous. And then for security reasons, because it was really very exposed, it was moved to a side gallery 
called the Aikens Gallery, which was specially built for it under lock and key. I arrived at Jefferson in, the, uh, in late 2005, a bit over 19 years ago, and I, I was there under a year, and I got a call from the chairman of the board of trustees. Now remember I said that McClellan got fired because he had a dispute with the board of trustees, so I got a call from the chair of the board of trustees, and he said, Charlie, after much deliberation, the trustees have decided to sell the Gross Clinic. And that's pretty much a direct quote from Brian, Brian Harrison. And I knew there was trouble. I knew there was gonna be trouble because this was a beloved piece of art. Um, and not only were they gonna sell the Gross Clinic, but they were gonna sell it to the National Gallery of Art in DC and they were gonna also have it shipped to Arkansas to the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. Two wonderful places, but very, dis very far from Philadelphia. And um, the deal was brokered by Christie's. The selling price <clears throat> was $68 million. Purchased by the Jefferson alums for 200 and now selling for $68 million. And I must admit, I gasped because there's a lot of money that our medical school could, a lot that our medical school could do with that amount of money. We, we don't have a large endowment. But there was a rider to the contract, and the rider to the contract said that uh, Philadelphia Jefferson. Uh, that any other institution would be given the opportunity to match the price, to match the price. So you come up with $68 million and the sale is null and void. That was the codicil, that was the rider to the contract. Um, so this became very much a, uh, a big deal in the end of 2006 in Philadelphia. Here's the, um, here's the front page of the Inquirer. On the very top line is that the Flyers came up empty in Pittsburgh in hockey, but a divisive deal. The secret months-long talks to sell Aiken's Gross Clinic are causing anger and puzzlement. And here's another. What were they thinking? The people at Jefferson had the right to sell the Aiken's, the Gross Clinic, but the way they went about it rightly causes outrage. There were some clever little things that I could never come up with on my own. The Aiken sale is a gross insult. There's an artist, a painting, and a, a city's identity. Aiken's the gross clinic has inspired loyalty, devotion, and an effort to keep it in Philadelphia. There actually was a huge grassroots movement to raise money. School children in their, in their schools were raising money, almost like the March of Dimes whenever many of us were young people. They were raising pennies, nickels, dimes in order to keep the Gross Clinic local. Jefferson alums ripped the sale of, of the Aikens. So let's talk a little bit about why is, this is such an important um, masterpiece. So it was initiated by Aikens for, as I said, the Centennial Exhibition. Philadelphia was long a center of medicine in America. Aikens, as I said, studied anatomy and attended surgical clinics at Jefferson. He knew Gross, he knew of Gross. He mingled with the students. He was aware of Gross's preparations for this International Medical Congress and the history of American surgery. It's the only visual depiction that exi exists of the Ely Building's upper lecture room. And uh, this, is, this is the masterpiece. Now, he paints Gross at work. Um, Gross is standing supremely confident. Gross is charismatic. He's multitasking. So Samuel David Gross is ma uh, multitasking because he's operating and he's teaching and he's lecturing all at the same time. There are three generations in the room. Gross is 70 years old at the time. He's clearly the senior leader um, in his uh, tuxedo, uh, which was... Uh, sort of the garb of the day. His assistants are in their 40s, and then there's the apprentice-like students that are in the audience. Uh, Gross is in the surgical amphitheater. He's at the apex of the, of the painting, and uh, the cringing mother here at the back, the, the cringing mother, as her son is being operated upon, um, is the only woman shown, and um, there's an absence here of nursing. There's an absence here of, of women involved, uh, which makes it very dramatically different than the Agnew Clinic painted just 14 years later. So seated to the left and behind Gross is the clerk. The student observers are in the pew-like seats. The surgical instruments are in the foreground. 
The patient is an adolescent male. He's lying on his right side. His hips and knees are bent and he, his left thigh is exposed. This is osteomyelitis. He has a sequestrum and Dr. Gross and his assistants are attempting to debride the sequestrum. And the figures in the portrait are well known. There's Drs. Briggs, Hearn, Barton, and Apple. And his son is actually uh, in, the, in the background. Here's a, here's a little, um, uh, this is a sketch, a pre-sketch for the masterpiece. This is Samuel W. Gross. And actually this is Aikens right here. He paints himself into many of his portraits. And then here's a close-up of the individuals working on the exposed left thigh um, and the anesthesia uh, being delivered here, ether, ether anesthesia. So the painting is prevalently and relentless dark in tone. The figures are dressed in everyday clothes, as was the custom of the day. The viewer's attention is drawn to Gross and his high dome forehead, bathed in ambient sunlight coming through the skylight. Gross is the only erect participant. There's an aura around his face, his sober concentration, and there's blood. And this is why it was excluded from the main exhibit hall. There's blood, uh, blood oozing from the patient's wound. There's blood stains on the table linens. Um, there's uh, blood stains on the shirt cuffs, et cetera. There's blood stains on the assistants. There's absolutely no effort here of Listerian antisepsis. And remember, Joseph Lister had traveled to Philadelphia just shortly before this. And, uh, Gross was not, uh, he didn't take up Listerian antisepsis. Here's a close-up of the hand, the blood-stained hand, uh, bare hand, and the scalpel. So the sole non-medical participant, the mother, is distraught. There's, she, think, of, think of this woman. Uh, she has never seen a, a TikTok video of this. It didn't exist, right? There's no moving pictures. So the, the woman is here brought into a, a setting that is completely alien and foreign to her. She hears, she, she sees the blood, the smells of the ether, the sounds of the instruments. She turns away, she covers her eyes, her, her fists are tensely clenched, claw-like hands. She's ignored by everyone, ignored by everyone. Uh, modern nursing fixes that, and yet she's linked to all of them. The drama is heightened by the use of color, light, prevailing darkness. This is a true masterpiece. It's a depiction of a scene witnessed only by a few outside the medical establishment. And hence all this consternation about its sale because it really represented the, the, a core value of, of Jefferson Medical College. And here's, uh, I know many of you are very familiar with this. Some of you are real experts in this field, but this is the Agnew Clinic uh, painted just 13, 14 years later. And you can see surgical garb uh, worn uh, you can see uh, a nurse very much involved in this mastectomy uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. So uh, obviously there's quite a difference between the Gross Clinic and the Agnew Clinic. So the story ends well. Uh, the money was raised, the Gross Clinic to stay in the city. Um, there's a cute cartoon here by Tony Off who uh, shows, to, it, this happened around Christmas time, this shows the, the painting, the Gross Clinic, being returned back to Philadelphia by Santa Claus. In fact, the portrait never left the city. This is completely fictitious. It, it actually never went to D.C. It never went to Arkansas. It stayed. The money was raised. Uh, and um, now uh, you're, we're able to see the, this magnificent masterpiece uh, in locally. This is me next to the portrait right before it was, underwent uh, dramatic renovation. Um, so briefly as a little postscript, talk a little bit about conservation, restoration, public display. So um, the Philadelphia Museum of Art and PAFA got together, um, put, put over $30 million in, they took on some debt, um, and they were able to restore the Gross Clinic after about a year. It, it's a magnificent thing to see, to stand in front of it and, and, and visualize it in person. Uh, I had the opportunity to participate in a symposium, seeing the Gross Clinic anew, uh, happened several years ago. Uh, here's the program from that. And what's really dramatic is if you go to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, you can stand and just turn your body 90 degrees and see and compare uh, the Gross Clinic and the Agnew Clinic. They're literally right next to each other, which is marvelous. Um, and here's how it's been reframed and, and really uh, we also sold, we had two other um, Aikens 
uh, portraits, uh, one of Rand and one of Forbes, a chemist and an anatomist, so uh, those, were, those were part of a different sale. Um, Swarthmore College, which is in the suburbs of uh, Philadelphia, uh, did something cute in their art class. They did the Gross Clinic in 3D, and that was sort of a fun thing to go and see. Um, and here's a, this is the article about it in Surreal 3D. Um, the painting does commute back and forth every six months. It, it leaves the Philadelphia Museum of Art and it goes to PAFA, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and then goes back and forth. That was part of the deal. And uh, this is me, um, uh, a grateful patient who was an artist, uh, put my, uh, my face uh, where Dr. Gross is. He was nice enough to give me some hair back, so that was nice as well. So um, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to give this talk. What we've done is briefly gone through a 199-year history of the founding of Jefferson in 1824 to a canvas hidden in a side room in the 1876 Centennial Exhibition purchased for $200 to the sale for $68 million to the Gross Clinic in 3D. All that happened in the short space of 199 years. Thank you for the honor of delivering this lecture as part of the Archives and History Committee of the ACS. Very much appreciated it. Uh, Ted, thank you for giving me the chance to do this, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Much appreciated. This is our department at Jefferson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We uh, have time for some questions. If anybody, please come to the microphone, please, to ask questions. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. it um, Samuel Gross was a historian, so he wrote up the history of Kentucky surgeons that was published, and he included Ephraim McDowell. And I, don't, I believe if not for Samuel Gross, I don't think we would know of uh, Dr. McDowell and the operation he did Christmas Day, 1809. But he also showed up for a commemoration of that operation, and he was given the knocker from the door of McDowell's home where the operation, and he took back to Philadelphia. I'm just wondering if... Any idea where that might have ended up? Uh, I, I don't. I mean, oftentimes those things get made into gavels, and the yeah. gavels are used for various, you know, to start various meetings at right. the, the Southern Surgical, et cetera. Yeah. But um, I don't think we have that in our uh, archives. Uh, we just got a wonderful gift from a, uh, from a faculty member to expand our archives. We have a lot of material in our archives, as you might imagine, after 199 years. And uh, we're going to be able to put more and more of it on display. But you're right. I mean, there's the Gross professorship at the, at, in Louisville, and he uh, he spent a good part of his uh, adult life in, in Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Dr. Yell, uh, Ed Checkin from uh, North Carolina. But I grew up not far from Cannesburg, uh, so it was fun hearing that history. Uh, the question is in the in the painting you mentioned the uh, surgical clerk. And you know, it, it, it occurs to me the idea of a clerkship, or do you have an idea of what the uh, what the role of was for the surgical clerk at yeah. the time? Yeah, that's Frederick West. He he is in the, he is he's painted in, and he's taking notes. He he is he's recording what goes on and uh, taking notes about about the operation, and um, that was very typical uh, of the day. I think it wasn't typical to have your son watching over your shoulder necessarily. It wasn't typical to have Aiken sitting in the audience, but th this is clearly, um, this painting, by the way, unlike the Agnew painting, the Agnew painting was commissioned by the people at the University of Pennsylvania, and in the Agnew Clinic, the individuals in the audience, you can actually tell who they are. They're, it's very clear to tell who they are, and because they paid money, they wanted to be able to see themselves in the portrait. And in the in the Gross Clinic, it's not as clear uh, who the who the uh, who the audience is. Michael, yeah, Charlie uh, Mike Nussbaum from Roanoke. Uh, just one point, you know, why would Gross, who was from Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, why did he go to the University of Cincinnati? and leave Philadelphia? I, I, I mean, I know the answer. Do you know why he went to Cincinnati and why that was such an important place for anatomists? You, you're you're going to stump me, so please so, tell us No, but answer. I mean, it's really important because it was a time when you could not, there was, uh, you know, as we heard yesterday in the, in the history uh, 
posters, uh, getting access to bodies was very difficult. Cincinnati was the pork slaughter capital of the country, and pork parts were the closest you could get to human anatomy. So a lot of these anatomists, uh, Billings, Gross, all went to Cincinnati because they had access to lots of parts. And then from Cincinnati, he got recruited down the river to Louisville until he returned home to Philadelphia. So just Thank to you. add to Thank your you, story. Michael. Yeah. Clearly, you know, Philadelphia was um, a hotbed of controversy over the, the body snatching issues, but. Would you comment on the, Ken Maddox from Houston, would you comment on the offspring of Gross? There are numerous Gross surgeons in this organization, one a trauma surgeon and practice very close to the city. So do you know about what, if they're related, and uh, have they made any comments about your comments or the Gross Clinic uh, masterpiece? Well, thank you for asking me that question. Um, so he, he and his wife, Louisa, had, had four children. Pardon me, had eight children. Um, four died in infancy or adolescence, and four survived to be adults. His oldest son, Samuel W. Gross, Samuel W. Gross, succeeded him as a chair at Jefferson. He was married to a, a woman named Grace Revere. Um, she was a great-granddaughter of Paul Revere. And uh, after Samuel W. Gross died of pneumonia as a young man with Osler at his side, so Gross's son, Samuel W., dies. Osler's there. <clears throat> Osler um, ends up marrying his widow. Uh, so Samuel W. Gross had no children, um, but Lady Grace went on, married to Osler, had two children, one who died six days old, a meningococcal disease, and the other, Revere, died in World War I. And many of you may know this, uh, the, the, phys the physician that cared for Revere Osler was a fellow named Harvey Cushing. I mean, you can't make this up, but. So that's his oldest son. His youngest son was A. Haller, A. Haller Gross, and he went over to the dark side and became a lawyer. And I don't know much more about the lawyer. And then there were two women, Maria and Louisa, they both married Horwitzes, spent some time in Baltimore, and it was Maria that actually endowed the, the professorship that I sit in. Um, so Samuel W. had no offspring, and, and A. Haller, I don't know his, his lineage. Um, of course, the name Gross is a fairly common name, so. Yeah, I thought that was a fantastic uh, talk. Uh, if, you get the, if anyone gets a chance, Sometime in your career, you have to go to Philadelphia. And you have to go to Philadelphia when both the Gross Clinic and the Agnew Clinic are in the same space. Because that, that's a magnetic area for surgeons. It's, it's as close to hallowed ground as we have in, in, in surgery. And to be there is really, uh, is really a stunning experience. So. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Charlie again for the lovely presentation. And thank everybody for participating.